Well, good morning. <laughs> uh, let's do better. Good morning. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. That's a biblical attitude. And I hope that it is your attitude today. And even if it's not, may I suggest to you, you're still in the right place. Because this is the place for us to be transforming our lives and our attitude and our personalities. Uh, I want to I welcome you being here today. Thank you for being here. This is a beautiful day and it is the right place to be at the right time in our lives. And this particular month, we're talking about something I find very difficult to talk about. I'm just going to be honest with you at the outset. I find it difficult to talk about happiness. And I find it difficult to talk about it, especially in light of the trials and struggles I know so many of you are going through in your own lives, and also the trials and struggles that this church has been through here, here lately. Before we get into that, I want to remind you that as a follower of Jesus, you are in essence an ambassador of Christ. And what that means is, are you listening, Monday through Saturday, you represent the person of Jesus to people who may have never known anything about a life of faith or about church or anything like that. And so what that means is if you're following Jesus, you're living a life of gospel sharing. Whether it's just in passing talking about the the fact that you are a person of faith or that you go to church... However you communicate that, uh, that is part of who we are. And so I'm bringing that up because on September 22nd, which is two Sundays away, it's the perfect opportunity for you to invite somebody for our Invite a Friend Sunday uh, that maybe you have been talking to. And if you haven't been talking to, you still got two weeks to find somebody and to bring somebody with you. I'm really encouraged and excited to see who each of us will bring on that particular Sunday. I want you to be thinking about that because it can be a day of blessing. A day of blessing for the people that you invite. A day of blessing for you because there are people you love and care about that may come with you. And a day of blessing for this church as we gather in fellowship and get to know new people. I want you to keep that day in mind. It's an all-in-one Sunday. There's details about it in your bulletin. So last Sunday was a very important Sunday for our church and for the lifeblood of our church and for the attitude of our church because uh, we have been through a lot. And and I wanted to take a moment and to talk about you know when times of struggle happen, it's very important for us to have the right frame of mind about those things. Because there are a lot of myths that people believe about trials and about struggles in our lives that happen to us. The truth of the matter is we believe a lot of myths about while we go through difficult times. And not to rehash the lesson, but I just want to remind you, if you, if you don't know this already, let me just, let me just countersink this, this point for a moment. The truth is, if you're struggling in your life right now, it may be for various reasons. It could be just because we live in a fallen world. A world that is devastated by the effects of sin and destruction Uh, selfishness in the world. It could be that, quite frankly, the devil may be bringing things into your life to cause your faith to weaken as he did with, with Job in the book of Job. We read about these things. There could be all kinds of reasons why you may be struggling. And the important thing for us is to to have the right worldview in the midst of that. Because the truth is, we could look very easily at our lives and we could look at all the things going on in our lives and we could say to ourselves, why would anybody ever want to function properly in a world that looks like this one does? I I mean, how do you live your life in a positive way when you see so much negativity in the world around you? But I want to remind you... That, that the Bible from cover to cover is astonishing. And it's astonishing in this way in particular. Because even in the midst of the struggles of the people of God, there is so much conversation about happiness and about joy. And I find that astonishing. Because when we do struggle, the last thing in the world we want to think about is joy or happiness. And we may look at that and think, well, it's just... You know, the the biblical writers are just kind of sweeping struggles under the rug and acting like nothing bad ever goes on. And I want to say to you, that is not the biblical view. 
The truth is, you find these verses about happiness and joy, they are listed over and over again during the most dire of circumstances in the life of the people of God. And it's precisely in those moments of struggle that they begin to hone in and to focus on a perspective of life that provides for them happiness and provides for them joy. Are you ready for this? Maybe I lost you on some of that. Strap in. Let's just do a biblical survey really quickly. You're, you may hate this, but I'm just going to run through a bunch of verses. I've got, I, I'll be honest with you. When I stand up, and especially when I struggle with a lesson, I've got nothing better to offer you than the Word of God. That's true every week. So let me just give you some words, okay, from the Word of God. 1 Samuel 2.1 My heart rejoices in the Lord. 2 Chronicles 29.30 They sang praises with joy and bowed down and worshipped. Psalm 16.11 In your presence, God, is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 37.4 Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 43, verse 4, To God my exceeding joy. Psalm 97, verse 12, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. The passage you heard Brother Paul read just a few minutes ago, Proverbs 17, 22, A merry heart, or a happy heart, does good like medicine. It's medicine for your life, he says. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18, Yet I will rejoice... By the way, circle in your mind that word yet. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Nehemiah 8 and verse 10, Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Romans 12, 12, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope... What a title! Isn't that awesome? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And then 2 Corinthians 7, 4, I am overflowing with joy in all my affliction. Do you get it? That's just a taste of it. I mean, we could spend the rest of our time right here just going through verse after verse. And I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. These verses are written in the midst of struggle. That's why I said, circle in your mind's eye that word, yet. Yet will I rejoice. These things are said in the middle of people suffering. So how is that possible? How is it that you can go through some of life's darkest circumstances and still hold on, sometimes white-knuckling, sometimes by your fingertips, and yet still hold on? to the joy that the Lord provides for your heart. Just sort of as an oasis in the midst of all um, just the desolation going on. I'll never forget one time I was preaching at a... I was visiting as a visiting preacher. And you never know what you get into when you go to a place and you preach uh, someplace new. But I remember I stood up and preached and uh, you know, after we were getting ready to go uh, have a meal, I think, and a guy came up to me, and he looked about like this, this, why I used this picture. Uh, and he said to me, should a preacher ever be joyful in the pulpit? Now just imagine somebody walked, you just delivered a, you know, a teaching session or a, a lesson, and somebody walks up to you and they say that. What are you going to say? I mean, immediately you're on your heels, right? Should a preacher ever be joyful in the pulpit? And he, his point was, <laughs> His point was, he thought I was too filled with joy as I preached on that Sunday morning. I mean, just think about that. I'm just trying to be myself. I'm not up here trying to perform in one way or the other for a certain group of people. I'm just trying to be me. And I was preaching. And I believe I have good things to preach about. I believe I have joyful and happy things to present. And as he said that to me, and I'm kind of snarky, I'm just going to be honest with you guys, I can be snarky, I can be sarcastic, and the first thing I was thinking is, well, I am sure haven't seen you smile all morning. I didn't say it, because I'm following Jesus and I'm trying to be better. But I thought it. 
But the guy went on, and he had this whole like mini sermonette he had prepared for me. And he, he essentially got down to his point, and he said, God doesn't want us to be happy. God wants us to be holy. And I thought, well, I think that depends on what you mean by happiness. Because there is a wrong happiness that we understand in the world, right? There's a wrong happiness where you try to seek joy from things that are worldly, from things that are sinful, from the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, where you try to seek happiness and joy from having the right job or the right spouse or, or, or maybe from comfort. Maybe comfort becomes the thing that you think about. If I could just you know, have comfort in my life some way. There is a wrong happiness. I'll, I'll grant you that, but but there's also a holy happiness. Are you tracking with me? A holy happiness where you find deep and lasting appreciation and joy in the person of God and what He's done for you and continues to do for you every single day. And so when you have that kind of perspective, if somebody says to you, God doesn't want you to be happy, He wants you to be holy. He definitely wants you to be holy. But can I suggest to you this a false dichotomy? Can I suggest to you it's not either or, it's both and? That God wants you to be both holy and happy? And that in fact those things should actually go together. That the, let me prove that for a second. Do you think God would ever be happy with you if you did everything in your life right, but you didn't love Him? Do you think He would be happy with you? Absolutely not! <laughs> He would not be happy with because all you were doing, you were just going through the motions without the emotions. And that's not the way God ever intended for His faith to work. For people of faith to live. And so let me, let me push it a little further. If you have joy in somebody, if you love somebody, then it's natural you're happy with them and about them, right? Right? Uh, I love my daughters, and I find joy in them. Do you see the illustration? Do you see the analogy? People that you love, you find joy in them. You find happiness in their presence. And this is the thing I'm, I'm saying. There is no way to really be holy without happiness in God. I'm not saying some blind feeling that you just kind of walk through life with, and you kind of ignore the struggles you're going through. I'm just saying that you have to love God, and that in loving Him, you find joy in Him. And so that's why Paul can write in the verse we looked at a minute ago, where he can say, uh, I rejoice in spite of my sufferings. That is why Jesus would say, you rejoice, and no one can take away your joy. He said that on the night he was going to die. John 17, 13, I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. So, to not enjoy the presence of God in your life is actually to dishonor Him. I'm going to push it that far. So you got an outline. I want to just go through three thoughts with you from Romans chapter 8. I want to invite you. Did I already invite you to turn to Romans 8? I can't remember if I did that. Let's do that. We're just going to camp. I gave you, what, 50 verses. Now let's, let's go camp out in Romans 8 and let that book, and let Paul teach us for just a moment. I want to invite you to write this down at number one. This may be the most important idea of the morning. We, we can understand the true nature of happiness because our bad turns out for our good. And I want to invite you to write that down. Our bad turns out inexplicably for our good. And it's astonishing for us to think about that. That the evil that happens to us in life, sometimes way down the line, actually becomes an occasion that brings about good in our lives. And it's hard to explain that. It's certainly hard to live through it. But our, good, our, our, our bad turns out for our good. So, don't take my word for it. Time out. 
Are you listening? Don't take my word for it. Look at Paul. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28? It's one of the, I think one of the most important verses that you will ever memorize in your life of faith. Romans 8, 28. Paul writes, And we know that for those who love God, is that you? For those who love God, is that you? All things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. So let me just pause here. Do all things happen to you? What is your all things? What are the all things going on in your life right now? I mean, I could just scan the room and I automatically know. All things are going on. We all have things going on in our lives individually and collectively. All things happen to people of faith. The last thing, though, that you ever want to do in this world is to tie your happiness to things that will never last you. To tie your happiness and to bolt your life down to things that are fleeting and will never give you lasting happiness. And I want you to hone in for just a moment back on those, verse, those words in verse 28 where, he, where it says, and, and look at your translation, okay? Does it match the one on the screen? God causes all things to work together for good. Time out. That does not say God causes all things that happen. Are you hearing me? It does not say God causes all things that happen. It says God causes all things that happen to work out for good. Literally in Greek, it just says God, all things, works into good. And the, and the translators always struggle with what to do with that. But the, the literal original words are God, all things, works into good. Now, now just that by itself is a powerful, powerful message that helps to shape the way that we view our own lives. That yes, we live in a fallen world. And yes, those things hurt. But the truth of the matter is God is at work behind the scenes of your life even when you don't know it. That God is still working and God's never late. And though it may not match my timing or yours, the reality is I may be impatient, but He never abandons those that He loves and those who love Him. So the implications of this ver verse are massive. Because they, they tell us, first of all, all things happen to Christians. So if you signed up for a life of comfort, guess what? Read the, read the fine print. <laughs> and you get that whether you're a Christian or not. You know that, right? You, you get the bad stuff and the suffering whether you're in faith or not. But also an implication of this verse is that God is at work and that when things work out for good, that's God's doing. And it's hard for us to see those things sometimes. And so Paul can say, my life overflows with joy even in the midst of suffering. Because, why? Because he's got this worldview, alright? So number one, because our bad turns out for our good. Number two, because godly happiness will never fail you. And what I mean by this is that God has a covenant love that He has attached to you as His child. And He does not abandon His children. And if you understand the pain it causes you as a parent when your child hurts, then you also understand the concern that your Heavenly Father has for you when you hurt. Now let me ask you a question. When, you're, when your children hurt, can you immediately always fix that? I mean, I wish that, there are times when I look at my... The hurt maybe one of my children is going through, and I, I wish I could take it to, into myself so they wouldn't have to deal with that. But that's not the way life works. And there may be moments when we look at God as His children and we say, why are, you know, why are you not intervening quicker? Why are you not intervening faster? Why are you not working all things to the good at a more accelerated rate? And there are just times where Wisdom escapes us. But it's precisely in those moments that we have to trust deeper. And I know that's not an easy message to hear. 
but it is the biblical view. So we go back and look at our text in Romans 8. That was verse 28, which I love. Verse 29, I mean, we could spend a week on 29, but I'm not going to. I just want to highlight a couple of thoughts. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to do what? To do what? What is your ultimate destiny? Scholars, Christians, followers of Jesus, what is your ultimate destiny? To be conformed to the image of God's Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. So, the point of that is that God is working in your life to bring you into conformity with His Son. Meaning, He's working in your life every day behind the scenes of your life to make you look more and more like Jesus every single day. Alright, are y'all tracking with me? Because listen to what I'm about to tell you. God's Son suffered. God's Son hurt. And it should be no surprise to us that we will too. And yet, what did God the Father bring out of the suffering of God the Son? What did He produce out of that? I'm talking infinite good. Infinite good. And I want you to know, in the midst of your hurts, that God is doing right now a hundred things behind the scenes of your life. Maybe you know about one of them. Maybe. You're aware of one of those things. But I promise you there's coming a day when the curtain will be pulled back and you'll see and you'll know. So there's a vital thought there. So I want you to understand, God is bigger. God is bigger than your circumstances. God is bigger than the pain going on in your life. God is bigger than the people in your life who are causing you stress and hurt and heartache. God is bigger than every wrong you've ever committed in your life. His grace is deeper and His mercy is broader than any of those things. And God is greater than all of your circumstances and He is available. And there is a commitment God makes to us as His covenant children. God is committed to you finding happiness. But are you hearing me? Not just worldly happiness. Not worldly happiness. To find happiness in Him that cannot be assailed. That cannot be moved and cannot be shaken. Alright. So number one, God takes our bad and turns it into good. Number two, godly happiness will never fail you. Precisely because it's the kind of thing that nothing from the outside can harm. And then third, and last, because our best is yet to come. Because our best things are yet to come. And I want to I kind of just take two minutes on this and we're through, okay? Y'all seem tired today. Are we tired as a church, maybe? That's, that's natural. But know our best things are yet to come. I want you to notice how Paul ends our section out. Okay, Romans 8, verse 30. Those whom He predestined, He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. And now watch this. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. And I want to just pause and ask, what is glorification? Are you ready? Glorification is the removal of every sinful proclivity that you have. Glorification is the complete purification of your soul so that you see the world and you see life the way that God sees it. Glorification is the holiness of your personality. And glorification is where God, here it is, let me risk it, glorification is where God takes every injustice and wrong that's ever happened to you and He makes it right. He causes all things to become new. This is the beautiful doctrine of glorification. And for Paul, this is what he says, you have. 
And so I want you to understand, you have been designed as a child of God for unimaginable happiness that sweeps over every circumstance of life, washes over it like a wave, a tidal wave, and and cleanses your heart. This is a knowledge that's very vast and important. And so this is why Paul will write in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, that the pain you've been feeling cannot compare to the joy that is coming. Let's, let's pray about it. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and we're just so very thankful that you never give up on us, that you love us, that you help to shape the way we look at the world, and that you give us ultimate reasons to be happy and to be glad even in the spite of the darkest of our last moments. And I pray this morning that you would cover all of us with your love, with the joy that is unshakable. Inject into our hearts the knowledge and and the happiness that comes with knowing that there is nothing, no circumstance that's bigger than you in our lives. Help us to love you more and to trust you more. It's in the name of Jesus we pray it. Amen. So what I'm talking about this morning is the only thing in the world that lasts. This is Paul's message to you today. Will you receive it? We're going to sing a song of invitation. This is your moment. If you need prayers, I would love nothing better than to pray with and for some of you today. I'd love to do that. If you need to become a Christian, I I want to help you with that too. Paul can say all these things precisely because he knows he's one with Jesus. And and that's the reason and the motivation behind the things that he's given to us today. Let's stand and sing about it.